another. Hello again. What's up, y'all? Hey, hey. Babu here. Mr. Chalk. Mellow D. D Styles. Here with another episode of Building Better DJs coming to you live from the Beach Junkie Institute of Sound, Glendale, California. Yes. Um, if you like what you're hearing, check us out on all of our social media at the Beat Junkies or at Beat Junkies, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Make sure you check us out www.beatjunkies.com for our record pool, mm-hmm. beatjunkies.tv for our online school, and everything concerning our physical school, beatjunkiesound.com. Yes. But like I said, building better DJs, we're here once again talking to you from our point of view, the Beat Junkies, on everything Beat Junkies, everything DJ culture related today. More in particular, we're talking about highs and lows in our DJ careers. So we're getting kind our of, own personal. Yeah, highs and we're lows. getting getting very personal today. We're opening um, up Pandora's box. <laughs> and, and, and and I think the whole point, though, guys, is like you know uh, we've been in the game for a while, and I definitely think we have some really um, cool tidbits to share with people out there who are going through living the similar kind of lifestyle that we've been doing for the last thirty plus year, twenty thirty plus years. Um, and let's just start kind of early on as we started becoming, you know, professionals and started doing this more and more. Um, can any of you guys recall some of your early lows and highs being in this game? Mm. Lows. I remember being a DJ. Um, oh, I was 20 years old. and uh, How long have you been DJing at this point? Uh... Five years. Okay. Yeah. So. So you're invested already. That's yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm in it to win it, and um, you know, this was definitely. Uh, I, I had a job where I was working construction, so I was able to pay off, you know, my record pool fees and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, like I felt like I was getting these gigs and everything, and then all of a sudden, um, my girlfriend tells me that she's pregnant. <laughs> mm. And um, right after that, I think and, and like like week after week, something bad happened after that. So it was after that, I lost my job. Oh. And then um, it just became to this point where I had to like really like rely on DJing to survive mm-hmm. and to get to um, a point to where I could eat. And like I had a baby on the way. So it was a lot going on with me at that time. And th- there was a high and a low because I was very happy, you know, to, you know, I was in love with my girl at the time and I was very happy to be having a child. But it was just like at that point when I was DJing and really coming into my own, I felt I was getting a lot of gigs around the city and felt really good about myself, you know, confident about what I was doing. And, you know, these things happened where I lost my job. And then also, you know, with the baby on the way, it was a lot of pressure on me at the time. You know, but things, you know, picked up a little bit later on. After my son was born, I ended up going on my first tour. Um, so that was a high, definitely. And, uh, yeah, I'll talk about more about after that. But, yeah, I went on my tour. I came back and decided that I was going to stick with DJing and not worry about any more nine-to-fives at all. This is what right. I wanted to do. And that focus from there... Ended up, you know, ended, it, I ended up going into radio and then, you know, from there you know, on to Power 106, which I'll talk about later on also, too. Okay. Damn, bro, that was good. Bring up, like, the first time I broke a needle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, sure I'm, I'm talking about lo- the highs and lows, brother. That's I'm not what you sure said. I could, uh, if I have anything to comp that, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you guys, what about you guys early on, lows or highs? Um, D. Man, there's, there's, there's levels of low, right? So we're, we're, For sure. We're at... We're at a light low. Light right? low. Light, 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 light low. Medium low. Not medium as heavy low. as mine was. Um, <laughs> Defcon two. Defcon two. Yeah. <laughs> this was uh, this was like around. Uh, we said we're opening up, man. <laughs> 80, 87 maybe. It was my my first real like DJ battle. It wasn't like a DMC. It was a local uh, DJ battle in uh, San Jose, California. And uh, I got booed. I you know it was like a everyone went like uh, twenty minutes each. So basically back then, it, it was like a mobile sound system. Right. So there was maybe five other groups. And, you know, you bring out your light and sound, um, and everyone has about 20 minutes to, to rock. And I just remember everyone coming up to the front, and they introduced me, and I, I get into my set, and I start doing Rock the Bells. And everyone just, boom, and they all walk away. And I'm just oh, like, oh, fuck, man. I'm, this is horrible. Damn. I was my 
everything I was crushed. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Because I thought I was good, and I guess I I was not that that great. Yeah. And uh, you know, back then the, the the standards were different. No one was really scratching and juggling too too heavily. It was more about mixing and 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 you know, kind of what DJing is right now with the whole Red Bull Three style. It was it was like that style. Um, and I wasn't balanced. I was heavy heavily into scratching. Right. And juggling, and right. and the crowd was not feeling it, man. And so <laughs> I got booed, and my whole, uh, yeah. yeah, crushed. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah, yeah. I, I think for me it's probably around the same time, similar to yours. Uh, so I started DJing in '87, and just at home. And uh, my very first live gig um, was a high school dance at my high school in 1990. Um, but there was, uh, it's kind of a long-winded story, but basically, long story short, um, the class that was my senior, um, there was uh, uh, DJ White Knight. Um, he was dope. I mean, he was just like, at an early age, like he could just, he had all the scratches down. He had a full-blown sound system. He was just the man, like at school and even locally in the community. He was getting respect from the other, you know, mobile DJs, Retmatic, uh, DJ Curse, like everybody knew what was up with him, with White Knight. And so I always looked up to him, you know, and um, and so we had kind of a rivalry and even on a, on a on a larger scale, my class, just for some reason, we were just always at odds with his class. Just motherfuckers just did not fucking like each other. <laughs> like, just like on some like, wow. yeah, it was just always beef. And so anyhow, fast forward to my first gig, um, it was my high school dance and he had always done, White Knight had always done all the high school dances. So I finally get the opportunity to like, and it's my very first live gig ever. So I've been playing, you know, practicing for a couple of years and I felt, you know, I built up a little confidence and I learned, learned how to mix and I had a decent little collection enough to play like an hour set. So I'm really excited about this gig and um, yeah, it's lunchtime, it's a noon dance. I'm like, oh man, all my friends are there to support and everybody was excited, you know? And so I get up and I'm probably not even 10 minutes into my set and him and his whole crew were just standing like off to the side of the room where the dance was and they're just mad dogging me. And finally, he walks up to me and he was just like, yo, I'm gonna battle you right now. What? Yeah, and I was just like, so I was just like, whoa. Not necessarily crushed, but I just like, in an instant, I was like, yo, man, I don't want to battle you, man. You'll straight serve me right now. I was just like, I don't want none of that. You know right, what I mean? Right. But to me, that was just, it was just kind of deflating. You know what I'm saying? Because it was like, you know, something I was really looking forward to. Right. And um, just to kind of get that back. I mean, we're, it's all good now. Like, we're actually really good friends now. Like, we got way past that. Like, uh, motherfuckers yeah, are growing see, up. He adults. sees you now. That's why. No, <laughs> no. But I mean, I mean, even like years after high school, like, you know, he actually took me under his wing and started bringing me to get so shout out to white i mean that's my man right there but you know just like you know we were we were young we were kids and maybe there was a little bit of jealousy on his end i'm trying to psychoanalyze the situation but for me that was just like damn like you know just kind of like kind of spoiled my 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 big moment yeah. you know that i was that I was excited about so yeah that, that was, was probably, a style back then though you would just call dudes out right, oh, yeah. right then and true there, right? true true but i wasn't ready for none of that know. man i just <laughs> like but, I'm just trying, to, trying to get in there, man. yeah for me that uh i was shook man i was just like that was my first gig and he was the man you know what i'm saying he straight stepped to me like that so uh but yeah, for me that was probably my earliest recollection of like a like a low. What you what you call it? A soft low. What you say? Soft light low. low. Light, light low. low. Light, light low. low. Light. Medium low. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Light, light to medium. <laughs> Bad. Light uh, to medium. <laughs> uh, for me, uh, I think early on, I'm thinking about like the same time. I, you know, I was in a mobile crew initially starting out, um, and I remember we threw our first like gig. You know, it was like, oh shit, man, like we're gonna be different because everyone else. All the other mobile gigs are very much probably like you're talking about D more like it's 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 catered toward like like line dancing and like right, a, right. a debut yeah. or, a, or a high school dance and hold on to what, what was the name of your mobile crew? Spinners in Control. Spinners Ooh. in Control. S I K. Okay. Wow, yeah. Spinners in Control. Okay, so. with the, uh, Control with a K. <laughs> yeah, we're a little sick. We're a little yeah, we're a little different. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. All right. All yeah. right. Okay. All right. Sorry. So um, no one's a big deal because you know I felt like you know there's like oh man I think I found my my found my tribe like, you know. And you know, looking at it, you know, uh, you know, shouts out to all those guys. But it wasn't as what I was really looking for, you know. But it was one of those crews where, hey, this guy had some equipment. Mm. Uh, this guy can mix. Yeah, you can scratch. Uh, uh, you know, you know everybody. You know, and it was one of those kind of crews. Right. It wasn't like a bunch of DJs really. So I was really just, man, anybody I can practice and scratch with. I don't, you know, anything we could do parties. So we went and. Through this, we had this idea to throw a party. It's gonna be different from everybody else's because you know what? It's gonna be it's gonna be hardcore. You know, it's gonna be underground. You know, <laughs> it's gonna be tight. You Spinners know, Spinners in Control. Yeah, it's like, okay. This is in, in, in Oxnard. Like, okay. This is in, in, in Oxnard Camrio. Okay. I, I I can't remember where. I don't know if we threw the party in Oxnard or Ventura. Somewhere in the 805, we ended up throwing finally throwing, trying to throw this one-off gig. Okay. And um, 
remember we threw it. The turnout was kind of, eh, it was all right. It was all right. It was going, you know, and, and a few of my other guys had more sensibility than me, you know, like, you know, the guy who was in there because he knows how to rock parties, you right. know, the, the guy who's got the right tunes, you know, and I'm waiting for my turn to go on. <laughs> and, you know, like if it was already light, you know, and I didn't help anything because I got up there and I'm like, I'm playing Wu Tang, I'm playing Souls of Mischief, I'm playing, you know, like back to back. It was just everything, like, dude. And I just literally, like, in three songs, like the, the whole party just left. <laughs> like literally, I just cleared out the whole party, yeah. and, and like that was pretty much my end of mobile DJing right there. Mm, wow. So it, it, it was a bit were, of a low. Were you paying attention? I, I got to ask the question. Were you paying attention when people were like actually leaving the floor while you were playing these records? You no, know, I just, I, I just used to have such a shitty attitude. You know, I, I literally was up there like, "What's your guys' problem?" Like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing heat. <laughs> I'm like, are you guys tripping? Y'all yeah, yeah. are crazy. <laughs> but, you know, deep down inside, I went home and I was like, man, I don't, you know what I mean? I don't. And I went through a long period. Seriously, guys, from that period until probably I met you guys, I was just in the bedroom. Um, only way I made, you know, made, made any noise was to put out like a underground mixtape that I'd sell by hand or give out by hand. So right, right. that was a, that was a pretty, you know, low thing for me because you also was, also, the timing is I'm just out of high school when this is all happening. Mm. So it's like a lot of my friends left town and, and went to college. So I had this thing in my mind where like, shit, I didn't make it to college. I'm still around here. God forbid you see me at the fucking high school football game or at a house party. I'm staying away from all this mm. shit. You know, I was already kind of embarrassed and self-conscious. I wasn't, I wasn't doing well in school or, or whatever. And then like I'm putting all my eggs in this basket of DJing and my first... The gig is like a flop you know so like i was i was a pretty low-key depressed and i was starting to smoke a lot of marijuana so like i think i was like on a, a pretty much a low to medium low for, the, for those couple years you know yeah right, yeah right. yeah so conversely on, on on the other side of other in the spectrum like what's the your first recollection of like um like a oh yeah like a like a, a big moment you know what i mean like where it's just like something like you were really excited and okay and proud so, about so i think you know, maybe like two years into that low key light depression, I don't know how I got an opportunity. And this is before I met you guys, which was an obvious high meeting you guys in Santa Barbara. But the first time I got invited to play in Santa Barbara, which was not too far from Oxnard, was I don't know how I got the opportunity. I'm trying to remember, but EPMD Hit Squad came to town. Wow. You know, this is during the Hit Squad tour. I'm like. DJ Scratch, you know, I'm Red Man, I'm like losing my mind. And, uh, and actually, Loop Pack opened up. So I was there with Roams, and I got a slot to be an opening DJ. And I remember, I can't, I was so whack back then, but I remember I was just supposed to be playing tunes. I remember I obviously I took time to like do a little solo or something and show off. Right. And I remember oh, the, yeah. tra- the crowd cheering, and I felt good. And that was, that was definitely um, a, a low key high for me at that point, you know, like to finally get to this like, felt like a real hip hop kind of like where I finally wanted to be not this you know not the cotillion I don't want to be fucking shredding the cotillion I want to you know go where the rap scene is and the hip hop scene so that was kind of a low key high for me early on you know that must have been like 92 ish yeah Yeah. for me it was um, right after I went through losing my job and uh, you know my my son being born six months after my son was born I got an opportunity to go on a tour with um, I was a DJ for um, AOT um, Alvin What's up, Alvin? Um, another Latin time bomb. And we went on tour with Lighter Shade of Brown, a couple of other groups. But then we broke off from that tour, and then we went on a, a bunch of shows with Sir Mix-A-Lot and Technotronic and oh, High shit. Five. <laughs> so my first big experience um, after going through all the, the bad stuff that just happened was going on this tour. And I remember after coming back on that tour, from that tour, I just being at home in Bakersfield, and I was like, this ain't it. I'm not worried about a nine to five anymore I've, i went on this tour it's my first time actually getting on a plane and flying and and experiencing all this stuff being at shows and stuff and i just remember like this is what i want to do this is what i'm going to do and i'm going to do everything i possibly can to succeed with this and get out of the city that was my goal from that tour so that was a high for me for sure Word. sick sick what about you d um for me probably around 91 um I had just finished high school, graduated. A lot happened in 91. Yeah. <laughs> it's and good uh, year. it was always, uh, I think for all of us, it, it was always my dream to put out a, a record and, and have my scratches be on a record. And so uh, around that time, I had met um, another DJ from the Bay Area, Glenn Ari. Glenn, uh, what up, Glenn? And, and he's, he was a really, really dope DJ, like 
mixing wise uh, he was winning a lot of local dj battles so we linked up um he showed me like uh you know how to use four tracks how to use samplers like that and that just you know pretty much blew my mind and so from then he, he was like let's let's put out a record you know what i mean let's combine our money let's let's press up you know 200 300 copies so one side was a mega mix that he did, like almost like those uh, scratch party type type of things. Yeah. The other side were just instrumental beats, and one song that I made. Like, and um, back then I was heavily into uh, Miami bass, so I made the song, um, and it's it, it's pretty much my version of a Miami bass song where it's just like a 808 drums, mm-hmm. me, me scratching, and uh, we. Um, we pressed it on uh, on vinyl. Yeah. Um, came out around '91, and we sold it basically locally. Just you know, I, I have a copy of that. Is it fu- funky, funky. What is it? Funky breaks and grooves. What's oh, it called? That was the second one. Oh, that's the second one. Okay, yeah, my bad. Yeah, yeah. The first one was called. Uh, it was called Hype Style. It was just like oh, our, I don't have our names <laughs> combined. Which is, which is the one I posted on my stories the other day, D? The second one. Uh, was it the white or red? Label? White, white and blue. The white, white one is. I have the that's white and blue one. one. That's the yeah. second one. Okay, that's the one yeah. I have. The, the yeah. first one's called Hype Style. Yeah, that's so um, ninety one. Yeah, hype, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, that's a thousand bucks on eBay. Damn, right there. I wish For I had sure, that man. one. Yeah. Damn. But what's funny is I gave a copy to Q, right? And uh, he's probably like, "What the fuck is this bullshit?" <laughs> but he drilled a hole because we put a tone at the very end, oh, and so he drilled a hole on on, on the like. That was ninety one DMC routine. Yeah, and he used my record. For that, for that Ooh. battle, yeah, too. Yeah, that. he used that. Check this out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was so your I was like, record. Yeah. Cool. He thought that was cool. cool. Check, Check this out. out. Ah, shit. Yeah. Yeah. Now, so now, that's you know where it's from. now you know where it's yeah, from, y'all. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. So, anyways, that was that was a. <laughs> that's a pretty big high. Yeah, yeah. If you were using your shit at DMC. Right? Yeah, oh, I would have sure. been for sure. That's yeah, so sick. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so moving down the line, we're we're talking light to medium highs and lows, right? So. Let's get a little bit more serious, a little bit more personal. I don't know who's first. Let's talk a little later into our careers, like um, any highs and lows that we're comfortable speaking about. <laughs> I think for me, just in, in general, um, it was probably around that same time, you know, after I had that experience at my, my first gig. Um, this is probably like 92. Yeah, because I graduated in 91, high school. And I just remember it wasn't one specific gig or, you know, night or function or whatever. It was kind of this this feeling of, I knew that I was, you know, I was learning more. Um, I had definitely more scratches in my, in my arsenal and, um, I felt like I was getting better. And it was this feeling of going around those same crowds, people I went to high school with, the elder classmen that I didn't get along with, um, my own peers that we graduated in 91 with doing house parties, local stuff in my community to where, when I was going out and DJing, I could just feel and I could just sense kind of like this this cool, just unspoken respect that I was getting from my peers. And to me, that was like, that was a really cool hype because that like kind of reaffirmed the fact that, you know, yeah, I was getting better. I was improving like, you know, all my hours and hours of practice and driving my mom, my dad, my sister's nuts with loud music and it's time to death, like was paying off. You know yeah. what I mean? So for me, that was uh, looking back, like that was a pretty, that was a pretty cool moment just to, like I said, just kind of get you know, a little recognition and I started putting out like four track type projects and like those would, you know, dub copies, third and fourth track floating around the community. And, you know, people were like, oh, this kid Melody, like, you know, from Cerritos and like, he's, he's pretty dope. Check him out. Like, so stuff like that, like to me, that was, that was pretty special looking back, you know? Yeah. For me, um, right after I came back with the mindset of like, I'm not doing no more nine to fives and I'm just going to start DJ and start producing music. And, um, you know, reality kicked in, you know, again, I had a, a, a young, child at the time and uh, I started having to get another nine to five to start working so I remember um, still living in Bakersfield but I, my boy had a clothing company up here in Los Angeles and I came up here to work and uh, we, at the same time we were also doing local radio stations in the city mm-hmm. uh, so we're doing KKXX and we were also doing another radio station Power 1490 me and C minus my partner Roughnecks yep. and um, you know from doing those radio stations there was air checks that were floating around within the industry and power 106 got a hold of one and um they wanted to, um they wanted us to come up and do like a you know a, 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 like an interview and also to be uh, audition for um being a mixer on the on the show on the radio station so i remember c minus calling me and i was working at the warehouse i had no records on me i hadn't touched turntables like a couple of weeks and he says they want to try us out tonight uh, I was like, all right, this is like 94. Mm-hmm. And I was like, um, all right, well, then bring up your records and I'll just go off your records. And we um, auditioned that night on Big Boy's show. And uh, 
he, uh, Big Boy kind of like said, oh, snap, at the end of our mix, I said, there's some new sheriffs in town. And that was like the best feeling I had ever had at that moment for, my, for, for DJing, that somebody in Los Angeles that was an air personality that already heard a bunch of dope DJs was actually giving me praise for being, you know, the way I was at the time and, you know, on the tables. And that, that, was, that was definitely a high for me. We almost lost that opportunity, which became into a low, but then we worked hard and actually got the opportunity right back. And so we ended up mm. working at Power 106 and 95. So little highs and lows right there mixed in together. Oh, oh. How'd you bet? Well, going back to that time, you know, like that, uh, that I was just a hardcore bedroom DJ. Um, I, I think it, it led up to a lot of, a lot of highs for me. Um, and I remember, I think one of the biggest things was, and it's something I, I wanted to illustrate, you know, and I don't even know if you guys even really understood, but out in my area, I was kind of an outcast out in the 805 where I was coming from. And um, like I said, I was always looking for my tribe, you know what I mean? Like, and like I had that mobile crew, but it just wasn't really working out for me. And especially after that gig went, went bust, like our whole little thing just kind of, someone got, a, got into racing cars, you know, this guy went to the <laughs> army, like, you know what I mean? Like shit just started happening to where it just, it just all fell. Life and took I, over. Yeah. yeah, and I just became like, I was in the bedroom. But I, I had a few, like, big things. Beyond that EPMD show, that was, like, kind of a little cool little uplift. But I think f- fast forward, you know, meeting the Beat Junkies and battling Rhett was, like, a big early high for me. Um, like I said, I was, like, I didn't realize it then, but I was, like, you know, I was depressed. I was, like, a loner. I was fucking getting no ass just smoking weed <laughs> all day just in my room it's like i'm at the gas station or i'm at fucking home or i'm on melrose buying records like, like that was my life you know for a good three years and i remember you know like when i started bearing any little fruits of my labor from putting out mixtapes or practicing hard or just getting out on the street and you know going to rap sheets or whatever i had to do to meet people i remember i got this opportunity to go back to santa barbara and battle um in this big I don't know if it was friendship games or some fraternity sorority kind of mm. big thing that all these Filipino sororities and fraternities get together and all hang out at on one campus for one weekend and, and a slot opened up and I got in just from being a local guy. I wasn't really representing a school, but I got in there and somehow I ended up in the finals. You know, first of all, I didn't even know who what 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 it was. I just heard a DJ battle. I'm like, I'm there. I'm, I didn't even care. Come to find out, the beat junkies are judging and DJ Rep Maddox in there. Ruthless is in the battle. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh wow. you know, Ruthless. And you know, I was on on the outside of the bubble, guys. So I already heard of everyone. No one heard of me. I was scared as fuck. I was there with like my one homie Bill. I really, when I got there, it was like there was no turning back. I'm like, what am I gonna do? Just like sneak out of here? I'm like, nah, I gotta, I gotta like try, you know. And somehow I ended up in the finals versus Red. Somehow I beat Red, and that was like a big high. I know we didn't spank Red or anything, but I just felt like, yo, well, at least like, fuck. I met Red Matic, I met Melody and Curse and J Rock. I'm like, shit. I met Shortcut. Shortcut was with you guys yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. He was judging, and he did an exhibition fresh off a of New York seminar. I can't remember yeah. fresh off a of DMC or something. I was really, I was like, had stars in my eyes. And I didn't realize it. So that was a really big high to me because it was just like a nice silent fuck you to everybody that was hating on me in my area. You know, and eventually, you know, a year later, I ended up, you know, getting down with you guys. And that was a really high high for me because I really didn't have too much love in my area. You shocked it that night, man. I remember that. We all drove up from Cerritos, like we all posseed up, like piled in my truck and drove up to Santa Barbara. I'm lucky I didn't get jumped that night. I was was wearing all red. We were talking about you you the whole (laughs) way home. We're like, yo, that kid was dope, man. Babu was nice. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what's funny is Shortcut came back to to the barrier and he he told me about you. I remember he was like, yeah. "Yo, there's there's this new dude named Babu came that's out so of crazy. nowhere." That no, like, that whole year was like a whirlwind. I, and you guys remember that time because that's when we all really got tight. Like from that battle to Rap Sheet to the U.S. to the West Coast DMCs, yeah. like that was like a, just a life changing year for me. Like a, a year of just like wow, like I I I'm, I want to DJ for the rest of my life. Like no. this this is it. Like. Um, I I felt like a year ago, like these are just people on videotapes and just like names I've just heard of. Like, man, I'm on the phone with these cats now. I'm yeah, hanging yeah. out with cats. No, I'm like, sure. shit. I went to New York. I went to Rock Raiders crib. Like my my like every, it was a lot of yeah. highs. And actually, um, 
yeah, let's fast forward before we uh, yeah. before before I realize and I'm like looking at the skate. There's a lot of lows coming up. A lot oh, of yeah. lows coming so let's, up. Oh, let's, let's jump. Let's <laughs> jump. Let's jump ahead like uh, ten years, ten plus years in the game. So at this point, we've all, like you said, um, like we were saying, like been accepted. I guess you know mm-hmm. would be the the right word and um, had some opportunity mm-hmm. radio um, competing, had some success there. So let's fast forward now, like based on you know a decade. DJing, um, now we're kind of doing this professionally, right? Yeah. Um, so now it's like we're treating it like a, a business, right? This is our, this is how we're earning a living. So now, um, you know, shit is a little more serious, right? Like, you know what I mean? Because like the whole weight of our lives is, is you know, on what we do. Um, so let's talk about maybe, um, let's take it up a notch, maybe some more, you know, highs and, and maybe some more serious lows, unfortunate lows. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, yeah, so like from... I would say from like 1997 to about 2006, I was pretty hev- heavy into making scratch slash break records, you know. And by that time, by like 2006, I, I think I p- had put out maybe already like nine different like records. And I would say back then, like in '99, you could you could press up about 5,000 scratch records, and they would they would go quick, right? Oh yeah, I remember those days. Yeah, so. Around 2006, me and my wife moved to Las Vegas. We just had our um, first um, daughter born. She was just one years old. Uh, and um, around that time is, is when Scratch Records started to really slow down. And I pretty much depended on, on a lot of that just, just to survive, you know what I mean? I had bought a house out there, you know, and I, I got to support my daughter and my wife. And I wasn't really DJing out there. I wasn't DJing, period. You know, I was, I was doing mm-hmm. random scratch shows here and there. But for the most part, I survived off these scratch records. And this is around the time when, like, Serato started to, like, take over. And people were converting. And mm-hmm. scratching was sort of going down. And people weren't really buying scratch records. and Just records, period. Period, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just felt that dip. And I just remember it being a very, very rough time back then just because I was tr- trying to figure out how, how am I going to survive, man? How, how am I going to do this? And I remember, I remember, I I applied at at a random um, stores just to survive. Uh, I applied at like a grocery store. You know what I mean? I worked there for like two weeks. I worked at the UNLV bookstore for like a couple weeks. You know what I mean? Just like seasonal, just just to make a little, right, little right, money right. to get through. And, uh, yeah, it was it was tough. And to make it worse, that whole uh, housing crash happened. 2007. Oh yeah, and, oh, yeah, yeah. And a lot recession. of people lost their homes oh, yeah. in Vegas, and uh, yeah, that short sales and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah it was a real ugly time, man. So uh, I really couldn't survive in, in in Las Vegas at that time. So we moved back to LA, and uh, you know, I, I was able to to manage, but but I just remember that 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 rough time times, was, man. man. Oh yeah, it was, it was really tough. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, yeah, my story is pretty similar to yours. Um, just uh, you know. Um, I had always, my sole sources of income were radio for years, um, mm-hmm. working out here in LA, uh, some television stuff um, for a stretch of three, four years, whatever. Yeah. And then um, that catapulted me into the nightlife industry in Vegas. And so I started at the Hard Rock in 2006 and that ran its course um, for four years. In 2010, it was done. But during the course of those years, um, you know, my wife and I had bought a house um, out there under the guise that when the new club opened at the Hard Rock, I was guaranteed at least one night. So it made sense because um, I kind of expanded with the hotel. Um, my one night turned into a night, then the rehab pool party, and then another day at the pool, and then they opened a rock bar. I was there twice. So I was DJing out there four, sometimes five nights a week, Ooh. like making really good money, you know? And um, <clears throat> All of a sudden, it went from you know being promised, and then when it came time to negotiating, um, you know for the following year, which is 2010, all of a sudden they just pulled the plug. They decided to go a different direction, and my wife and I were pregnant with our first son. Um, he was literally due a month later. This all happened in October, and we had already bought the house, you know, um, so we were pretty much stuck out there. So my career in Vegas came to a very abrupt end, you know, um, unexpectedly, and I was out there without a job. Um, thank God my wife had a job. Um, and then our son was born. So, uh, yeah, like that, that 2010, um, I was able to network with some other cats and get myself another gig, you know? Um, and, uh, so yeah, it it all worked out, but there was definitely a period of like six months where it was just like, it was stressful, like on the financial end of things, you know, and, um, again, buying a new home, having a child. Um, and then, you know, um, to further it, just to be 
completely transparent with everybody. Like I made some really poor choices. Like I did a lot of things to compound um, the pressure that I was under, you know, um, started drinking, um, you know, started uh, being out in Vegas gambling, you know what I mean? Calling up Gambling Pete, like, Gambling yo, what's Pete. good tonight? Like, you know, um, <laughs> just <get> like <laughs> fucking off a bunch of money, um, just like putting myself in a bad spot, you know what I mean? Like just uh, physically, spiritually, mentally, like just, like I said, compounding like things that, a situation that was already stressful, you know? Um, so, and I did it to myself, you know what I mean? But um, but yeah, maybe that was my way of coping or whatever, but I mean, thank thankfully, like it all worked out. Like I said, I was able to get another gig and you know stay working out there but um yeah that that was a that was a tough time for me for sure for sure for sure yeah thinking about all this it's all a blur man but you know um wow uh so 95 you know i ended up working at power 106 and from 95 until 2000 i had my second child i had, I had two kids now i ended up getting married in 98 um but i'm working my dream job I'm working at Power 106, and uh, I'm doing, like, the late night shifts. So from, like, I'd come on, I'd mix, do a mix with Funk Dubious, some doobie, from 10 to 12, um, Monday through Friday. And then I would do uh, an air shift from 12 until 6 in the morning. Yep. And that, would, that was Monday through Friday. Um, so any type of mixing opportunity I would get on the station, I, w I would take. You know what I'm saying? No matter what the slot was. But that ended up paying off. Right. So... Fat, um, fast forward to 2000, I, well, actually 99 is when they wanted to bump me up. They said they were going to move me from overnights, and they were going to put me on during 12 to 1, um, Monday through Friday, and also 5 to 7, Monday through Friday. So I was going to be doing two mixed shifts. And I was like, all right. And I, I was scared to death because I was like, man, that's, that's heavy. That, you guys got me on pretty much all day. But all right, yeah, cool. I, I'm, I'm up for the challenge. And, you know, become a mixture coordinator at that time, too. From 2000 until, like, 2006, not going to lie, was popping. Yeah. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I had, I had those, you know, those weekly, those daily shows um, every week. I also had um, an underground show every Friday night, which is the Fantastic Four Friday Night Flavors from yeah. midnight until 3 in the morning. So I was, I was on the radio all the time. And, you know, I had a blast. I had a, had a lot of good times there. Fast forward to 2005. Um actually 2006 which was my going to be I, I didn't know it at the, at the time but it was my last year of power mm -hmm. and the beginning of the year they took away the specialty show mm -hmm. which was the Fantastic Four which I did with J-Rock truly out to C- they yeah. said okay we're going to cancel this and that was after eight years of running Damn. and so I was like alright but what's going to happen with me now well we're going to give you another slot mm -hmm. you know to make to make sure you're, you're good here so we're going to give you Saturday nights now too. So now not only am I doing five days a week, I'm doing the Saturday night mix show also too. Okay. And everything was good for that entire year until like September of that year. And that's when they pulled me in. They said they, they were going, to, the station's going in a different direction. Mm. And we are going to put these personalities here, which was um, Eric and Big Sife, Big Sife and Eric Deluxe. And um, we want, we have these opportunities for you, but uh, it's up to you if you want to take them. And for what they were offering me at the time, after all the work that I had done, I just feel, didn't feel like it was anything worth staying for. So I was like, uh, yeah. I'm cool, man. You know, I'm just going to have to figure this out on my own. And I did my last show October 2nd of 2006. I still remember that vividly. Damn. And I just remember after that, that next year, 2007, was probably one of the darkest years of my life. I started drinking heavily. Started spending a gang of money, whatever money I had made from power. You know, I, I, I separated from. Should have called wife. me, man. We could have did it together. At least <laughs> been miserable together. And shit. <laughs> I separated from my wife, and my my kids ended up moving back to Bakersfield, and I was still like now, you know, relying on clubs and gigs, whatever mm -hmm. gigs I could I could get to survive. So it was really a dark period of time. And at that time, I had left um, the Scratch Academy. So I was at I started Scratch Academy in 2005. And then I left in 2007 when I went through this dark period of time in my life. And I remember just like, just, I just remember just being in my apartment by myself and just drinking, just like, man, it's over. Everything I had done is, is over. It was fun, but it's over. And then, you know, at the end of that year, when I started my divorce, I decided I was going to reshape my whole entire life. I'm going to get in shape. I remember I used to be a big guy. So I remember started working out and just really started getting the mind state of, just like I'm going to succeed and I'm going to get past all of the stuff that that brought me down to this dark place and, and it eventually ended up working out yeah so, no yeah. you did it man I remember you going through that transition and just oh, like I remember rough. those days like you were you stayed with the bottle man it was, it was crazy oh, it was like, rough. and uh <laughs> yeah. 
you know, not no judgments, of course, but then and then like literally like you just like something clicked and you just like yeah, man, you just made you just cleaned yourself up and like you man, know what it was like, though, too. Like, you know what it was too. I started selling off records, man. I remember that just going to my storage and just like I gotta I gotta go to the B swap meet and Amoeba and all these places because I was low to make money. it happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then that's when everything started turning around after I got in that mind state though. Yeah, because when I was like depressed and like like feeling bad for myself, feeling sorry for myself and stuff, nothing was popping. But as soon as I turned it on, mm. that's when everything started turning around. Yeah, wow. yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. Whew. What about you, Babs? I miss the old Chalk actually. <laughs> <laughs> the drinker Chalk. He was he was fun. Yeah, he was. 2000, 2007 nah. chalk. It was a good time. Nah, new, new chalk is tight. New chalk is hella tight. Word. No, I think for me, um, you know, um, I didn't mention earlier. I got, I, I had gotten married and had kids pretty young myself. Um, had a wild ride with my partners, Evidence and Rocco, with Dilated. Yeah. Really, nothing. You know what can I say about that trip? I was also too. I felt like I was living my dream job. I, I'd always wanted to, to DJ for a real rap group and be a real part of a rap group and. And so, like, you know, we put out four albums on Capitol Records and, you know, tons of highs and lows within all that. But um, I think for me, uh, the hardest time of my life was around 2009, 2010. You know, I split up with my ex. And you guys all know it was a really tough split for me. I remember being um, on the phone with you, brother. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was like a, on, on top of that, I think I was burnt on the music industry. I think being on a major label really sucked the it, life. It will do it to you, yes. <laughs> um, out of, of, of the experience of of being an artist or a musician. And um, so it, it was it was depressing, but it was definitely a, a time of, um, you know, for me, serious growth. I had to refocus my life. I had to step away from music. I had to focus on my children. I went through a horrible divorce. Somehow ended up with custody of my kids, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm a single dad. I had a lot of help, but um, it was something I definitely hadn't seen. If you would have told me in 2005 I would be a single dad in 2010, I wouldn't have even foresaw it. Um, but it all pr hit me pretty hard. Um, but after I gathered myself and got my mind right and came to terms with the situation and, um, you know, it led me to where we're at now, guys. And like, you know, what we're doing with the junkies now. Yeah. I mean, you know, compound also the fact that like things are dilated, changed, you know, something that was pretty tough for me too, guys, was just like coming from a major label record deal where they're giving us hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. We go on tour, make a few, you know, a few racks like that. Then the label doesn't like you anymore and they start starving you. And then mm -hmm. you realize you owe money when you think you're supposed to make money. You know, just the whole typical record label experience. You know, I'm, I'm, I don't even know how we made it through without being any more in debt than, than or, or just being under, you know, kind of made it out there even somehow. So that was a bit of like changing jobs for me all of a sudden to be like, okay, I'm just going to be Babu, you know, I'm going to be producer and a DJ. And I tried that for a while, all while it was happening with my divorce and the split up. So that was a tough time for me. But I think the high was, um, you know, getting close to DJing again. You know what I mean? Like I'd stepped away just from music and DJing for so long. It was um, really um, something for me that helped me get through my hard time. You know, all this talk, we talk about getting ready for the school and preparing and all this, like, going back to the drawing board was a real big thing for me to just, like, help give me focus in my life. You know, having the school and our record pool and, and our online school, like, this is a big, big high for me these days, what we're doing, doing oh, yeah. now, guys. It's, it's, it's a high for all of us, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah you know? for sure. I was just thinking the same thing. I think that just something, like, really really special that applies to all of us, you know, um, just that the fact that we're in business for ourselves, you know, which is not easy by any stretch of the means. No, not at all. But, um, you know, um, thankfully we don't have to go apply, you know, for a job to make ends meet. We don't have to go do the corporate gig or I don't have to, you know, fly out to this city or that city to go get this check. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I think we're in a great spot and, um, yeah, a lot of blood, sweat and tears, obviously highs and lows, you know, yeah, for sure. um, but, uh, I I'm, I'm happy to be here. I feel like, you know, what we're doing is a very cool. I'm very thankful to have all of this, the school, no, we couple are. of amazing dot coms, um, solid crew. My, with my brothers, you know what I'm saying. No, so we're super um, blessed, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But definitely. I, but definitely. Uh, it seems like yesterday too for me, guys. I can, you know, I, 
I, I definitely thought about being an X-ray tech at one time, guys. I, th- I thought I, you know, my mom was really trying to talk to me about going going to DeVry. Oh, dude, I was going professional gambler. What are you talking about? <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm card counting, janky no, dice. I, mean, no, I was janky dice. No, was like, <laughs> no so seriously, like, you know, I was, I was over, going there. I, I was over here like 36, 37, seriously thinking about going back to ITT or something, dude, or DeVry. Like, you know, really rethinking like what I had invested my life into for the last 20 years. So career yeah. change, dude, yeah. yeah, dude. I was looking at being a 911 operator because I heard they. They make good money. I thought you really were, though. That was no, crazy. I was. I was looking into it. <laughs> I could see you doing that. See, that's crazy. At, at that age, for me, like when, I was, good going, at that when I was going through that dark period of time, I still didn't think about getting a regular nine to five. I, I was still, it, yeah. I, I was, I was still very focused on trying to succeed at this DJ thing. No matter how, how I was going to do it, whether it was going to be teaching, getting back on the radio, finding a dope club, a residency somewhere, I was still very focused on that. Even though I was losing everything at daily, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I right. still stayed very focused on that. I think when the, when I made the decision, when I was um, like 20, 21 after that first tour of, of the 9 to 5, I was done with that. I never, ever thought about getting a regular nine to five after that. But I'm glad I did though too because it led me here to working with my brothers and having our own school and um, you know, like staying focused on everything we got going on right now. It's a blessing, man. For sure. Yeah, and I I think that's I think that's something for everyone out there to take from all of our our funny stories is that like I think um, life always is gonna bring you highs and lows. Always. And and it's just you can't let it define you. I think like I've, uh, for me personally, I can only speak for myself is I've found a place in the middle where, you know, where, when good things happen, I really don't get too excited. And when bad things happen, it's kind of the same thing. I don't get too down yeah. about things. Yeah. Um, and just as you get older, you kind of start realizing that like, you know, um, it's a yin and yang kind of thing. I yeah. think highs and lows are just part of your journey. Swings. Life is always going to bring you swings, man. It's a roller yeah. coaster ride. Oh yeah, right. roller and, coaster. Boy, and, is it? Yeah. And, and, and how? And you know, you know how you recover or how you roll with these highs and lows. That's what defines you. That's what defines you. You know. Yeah. There it is. So, um, yeah, guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Building Better DJs. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Babu, Mr. Chalk, Mellow D, D Style, 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 B Junkie Sound. We'll see you guys next episode, Building Better DJs. Peace. We out. Peace.